All right, everybody, I think we're gonna go on and get started here. Uh, we might have some folks join us along the way. Uh, this meeting is being recorded, so no, we'll make sure nobody, nobody gets uh, missed out on the whole presentation. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Blaze Saika. I'm a uh, senior project associate, project manager with MIG, and I'm um, here to uh, help present along with my um, uh, along with my staff and city staff here at San Mateo, the uh, Multifamily Residential Objective Design Standards at this community workshop. Goal here tonight is to get you acquainted with the objective design standards process and to uh, get your input on the future of design. So before we do that though, I'm gonna do a round of introductions uh, real quick. So I'm gonna throw it to uh, my teammates at MIG. Good evening, everyone. My name is Phoenix Alfaro and I'm a project associate on the MIG team. I'm Laura Stetson. I'm a principal with MIG. Hi, everyone. My name is Wendy Lau. I'm a planner with the City of San Mateo's Planning Division. Hi, everybody. My name is Julia Klein, also with the City of San Mateo Planning Division. Hello, everyone. I'm Christina Horsberger. I'm with the Community Development Department, City of San Mateo. Great. Thanks, everyone. So um, we're going to dive right in here. Um, just to let you know, we, we do have um, chat and um, mute turned on, but there will be points during this meeting today where we can have a, we'll, let, we'll have a discussion and input. So, so don't worry, we'll uh, just gonna go through this presentation and uh, we're looking forward to diving through that soon. There's today's agenda. Oh, we'll, we'll, let's welcome introductions. We wanted to give a project overview first, basically describing why we're all here. Um, also, then after that, we want to go into what are the objective design standards, and after that, a Q&A session to answer all of your questions around those. From there, I'd like to introduce uh, bas basic um, concepts around multifamily residential design in San Mateo, and um, after that, have a discussion on what you all think works and does not work as we uh, move forward in trying to formulate how these objective design standards take shape. So dive right into the overview here. Um, what we wanted to do is basically, you know, what these objective design standards call for is to create new standards to regulate design and govern design of multifamily residential and mixed use development projects in San Mateo. And that applies to new projects. This is all coming down from state law. And um, what we really want to do is have this holistic approach where we engage you all in the community and stakeholders and, um, combine that input with um, some technical expertise and basically shape what these objective standards can look like and um, how they can be applied. This is also a great point to reassess what we want to do um, in the community as far as residential, multifamily residential design. So what are objective design standards? This is, as I said earlier, these uh, come down from SB 35. This is the streamlined approval process uh, for the state of California. Um, Basically, what the law was intended to do was remove regulatory hurdles created by a discretionary process, which I'll explain later, um, in order to create, or not create, but streamline the approval and process of multifamily units. And this is, uh, all this was done to uh, help uh, address a shortfall in uh, development of these, uh, uh, basically residential units with throughout jurisdictions in all California. Um, what it does allow is it allows jurisdictions to take control of what, you know, what the objective design standards look like. So basically, this is, this is a great opportunity to go in and, and reassess what, what can and can't be uh, built as far as, these, um, as they take shape. So, you know, we have well acquainted with the fact that California has faced a lot of challenges in, uh, in a meeting the, uh, the demand for, uh, for housing in the state. And basically this is the impetus for the SB 35 as well as other uh, standards or laws that have come into, uh, into the pipeline. So where are these applicable? Um, basically all sites that can support multifamily residential and or mixed use projects will be subject um, with a few exceptions. So you know, this will include uh, all multiple family zoning districts. This will include um, commercial districts that allow both mixed use and multifamily residential. Also includes some uh, TOD and executive districts. Um, residential and downtown overlays that also permit multifamily and mixed use housing. 
uh, does not apply to specific plans that have their own objective standards, uh, work density bonus projects, commercial only projects, or single family homes. And then it can affect a range of projects. Basically, every project type piece that we see here, um, subject to these duplexes and triplexes in the lower end, and then, you know, going to mid rises and mixed use. Um, where we draw the line as far as what the effective design standards uh, control is kind of where this discussion will lead us tonight. So how will they work? This is a, um, it's a subject, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of questions that come up during this. Uh, we'll ask you to hold on to those questions um, for the time being, and we will have a QA and a period to help sort that out. But basically what it boils down to is quantifiable and objective versus qualitative and subjective. So basically existing co zoning code and development standards establish baseline standards, right? So you have setbacks, height, parking, that's already established. Um, the multifamily objective design standards will work with those to help uh, refine and give further detail to what those uh, standards would look like. It, in, basically in a qualitative and subjective approach, we have already existing multifamily design guidelines in the city. The way those work, you can see here, you can, kind of, you can see how the language is different in how the, they apply to different projects. So we, in a subjective guideline, if you read this text, in the case of if changes are greater, step back upper floors to ease the transition, that key part where it says ease the transition, that's subjective. There, you can't really define that through a, 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 a objective standard that has to be, basically has, there has to be, a, it has room for interpretation whereas an objective standard will basically attach a number or a specific um, set of criteria that can be unbiasedly applied. So it, when we see this as they apply to a discretionary and ministerial review, there's basically two camps, right? So you have deliberation around what is our subjective guidelines, which can be, which carry through the current process in the planning commission city council, whereas ministerially objective standards can be done and assessed uh, at a staff level. So what does this all look like? Basically with the current track, um, we have multifamily and mixed use projects being submitted in this scenario. And then planning staff will review against uh, ministerial, ministerial and discretionary, which is again, zoning ordinance development standards, as well as design guidelines. The next step, would be planning commission and or city council review using those subjective design guidelines to reach a credit decision. This process, as we added in the objective design standards which we're here to talk about today, will basically create, this basically creates a different track or project submittal complies, that complies with ODS or objective design standards, will basically be subject to the zoning ordinance and development standards as they are today but also adding this extra level of detail that the objective design standards sets up. So this does not require that planning commission and or city council review, but there may be some discretionary re review required under an example of a tentative map. So basically this is setting up a new track to where you have an ODS compliant product decision, but you also have the old track still preserved. So this, the, th the threshold of where that line is drawn is what we're here to discuss today and um, and this what this process will ultimately end up spelling out. So altogether, this is we have you know, existing development standard zoning ordinance, later on the you know, multifamily design guidelines, Let's apply that with what we're doing here today, along with other stakeholder review. And that's where we, that's how we land on the uh, multifamily. Uh, design standards that we'll end up creating. So I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Uh, we're going to dive right into a Q&A session. Um, you will see through your Zoom, you will have the option to uh, raise your hand. As you can see on the screen here, if you um, click on the participants window and click raise your hand, we can call on you and um, and have you uh, and we can answer your questions one by one. And uh, we'll work as we'll work to catch up with you all and. Uh, and facilitate a conversation. Also, I'm going to enable chat. So 
you can drop any questions that you might have into the chat box of this uh, of this meeting. So, as you can see in the bottom panel there, we have the chat option that you can send to everyone. So, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand or drop it in chat, and we'll uh, and we'll get to those. This looks like we have a raised hand from uh, from Travis, so I'm gonna go call on you real quick. Hello, Travis Duncan here. I work for Ceres Regis, uh, San Mateo based developer. Um, can you outline what um, differentiates large projects? I believe that the sort of existing pathway uh, is the only pathway for large projects. What, what qualifies as large? I might need to throw that to Laura, actually, could you? maybe help define what that. Sure, Travis, thanks for the question. That's something that will be defined through the objective design standard process. The state law is pretty clear that anything that is more than a single family dwelling, standalone single family dwelling is subject to this new law and subject to the objective design standards. And so the intent is uh, to, to look at different scales of development because objective design standards will be um, different whether it's a low-rise building mid-rise or, or a higher rise building so just in terms of you know what is a large development project um, I, I think we, we're going to look at that in terms of the the scale the height of the building and not necessarily the square footage or the density did, did you have a uh, Travis did you have another understanding that that you had heard elsewhere as to how this might apply? I think he's still on mute, please. Probably. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Yeah. Uh, I guess my, my question is really like, for large projects, will there be objective design standards? Good, thank you for clarifying. There, there will be objective design standards for um, everything that is not a single family home. So yes. Thank so we, wel we welcome comments on uh, what, what you'd like those to be. Can't wait to give them. <laughs> yeah, we have, a, uh, I don't see any other hands blazed, but we, unless you do, there are a couple of comments in the chat that we might want to go ahead and address. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have um, one comment. Something that we have a technical comment, but also go, what is the definition of mid rises in San Mateo? And that's from, uh, that's from Monique Davis. So, the definition of mid-rise is, is a development type that it's basically it's basically um, defined by the materials. Um, and it, it's hard to it basically it basically goes up to around four or five stories. Um, that's what a mid-rise is. It's sort of mid-rise mid usually um, is defined as. And um, it's I wouldn't I would just the mid-rise that I actually had earlier the example I would um I would say that this. Objective design standards could apply to those project types, but not solely. So I think um, part of this process is establishing kind of maybe where that threshold would be as far as we, as far as kind of having that objective design track with only ministerial review. Um, there was a question from Maxine wondering if um, you can raise your hand if you're not using video or call on via chat. And Maxine, if you go ahead and put your question in the chat, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and address it. Blaze, it looks like Keith uh, Weber has a question. There it is. Okay. Thanks for your patience, guys. So Keith Weber is asking, how is design quality and architectural compatibility maintained in the downtown historic district if qualitative standards don't apply? So that is a good question. Um, I think if... Hey, what, there's I think a First question is, There's a, does the specific plan cover downtown? Baby, uh, th thank you, Julia is nodding. So the, the objective design standards will not apply 
um, to anything that's within the downtown specific plan area. So as, as Blaze indicated, if there is something that is covered by a specific plan, the standards in that specific plan will apply. And I, I think it's important to, to keep in mind too, is that there will be these two tracks of, of development. So anything that complies with the objective design standards um, will be subject to this ministerial process. And so it's really important for us to, to define what that includes. If something, uh, if a developer chooses to do something a little bit different, that project would be subject to the, the discretionary process and, and you would be allowed to um, apply these qualitative standards. And so Keith, I hope that answers your question. I'm gonna go to a raised hand that we have now. Um, yeah. Let's go to um, Adam Nugent first. So I just asked to unmute. Let me know if you can unmute Adam. Hi, yeah, can you hear me? There we go. Mm -hmm. So with objective design standards, um, I, I interpreted them more or less similar to form-based codes. Are you able to control things like um, window placement and door placement from like design details that are, um, you know, relative to building size, building shape? Um, or are these objective design standards pretty basic in the sense of setbacks and heights. Like how, how detailed do objective design standards get in this interpretation? And uh, Blaze, let me know if you want to respond or um, I, if you want to. <laughs> I can dive into that. Um, okay. Thanks for the question, Adam. I, I think it, it really depends on the direction you want to go. So setbacks are already determined by existing development standards and zoning. And, and so that is referred to kind of like the baseline development standards that are already objective, right? So I think um, we, there are jurisdictions that choose to go into a finer level of detail uh, when they create objective design standards. Um, and some choose not to really get into, the, get, into those, get into the weeds as far as like window placement and sets and and uh, materials. So it really is up to the jurisdiction and what level of control or, or, and, or, and or flexibility they want to provide. But that is, you know, theoretically you could go into a fair, fairly high level of detail um, using the objective design standards. Adam, the, the important point is, is that, and this comes from the law is, and I'm almost quoting the law, is two reasonable people have to agree as to what that standard says. So if the city chooses to address window placement or things of that nature, it needs to be um, maybe not necessarily measurable, but really no gray area. It's pretty apparent what the city is looking for. Mm -hmm. So that it's, um, it's not an easy undertaking. I think the, the critical point is, is what are those design elements that are important for San Mateo and making sure that uh, those are worked into the code without making sure that there's sameness because these are certain. I think that's the fear that many people ha have had is that by having these standards, there could res uh, result a sameness of projects. And so it, it'll be a balance of um, understanding what the standard says, but providing some flexibility. And that might include, for example, a, a list that says here are 10 things you need to do at least seven of them. So that, that's a consideration as well to, to create that flexibility. So I'm gonna to go to another raised hand here. Let's go to uh, Seema. Actually, I think Monique, Monique Davis might be first at the top here. So I'm gonna ask Monique to unmute and see if we can uh, address that. Yes, I have a follow-up question to my original question. Just um, in the original slide of scope, the scope that was covered, it looked like the design um, standards would cover up to the mid-rises. Um, I do know um, from projects we're doing, or a project that we're doing, that there are some projects that are over like five stories. Um, will there be standards, or will this process also cover standards for those type of projects? Yes. But per yes. Uh, perhaps in a different way than it would for low rise or mid rise.
displays that we've got a long question from, um, I don't know the first name, so Rowinski. Ro Ro so I'm gonna go, what I'll do, I'm gonna go to the raised hands and then okay. uh, one more raised hand and then we'll go to some chat questions. So I'm gonna go to Seema, asking to unmute. Hi, um, I was curious about a point that you made earlier. I think you said that um, any project larger than a single family home would be required to have objective design standards that they um, could use in the design process. Does that mean any project larger than a single family home would have a path through ministerial review? Because I think you also mentioned that discretionary review is still available for projects that are large. Um, so I was just curious about, um, is the discretionary review for large projects by choice or could large projects even take a path through ministerial review if they met objective design standards? Um, the, I'll, I'll, be, I'll keep it simple. Um, yes, duplexes could, could choose a path to be ministerial. So in, anything more than a single family unit could choose a ministerial path if it complies with the objective design standards. If, if somebody wants to color outside the lines, if you will, that's when the discretionary process would kick in. So I'm gonna go to a few questions in, um, in chat right now. So S. Rowinski is asking, what does the state law allow for addressing neighborhood concerns since council and planning commission are not included in the approval? These concerns we're setting here concern adequate parking, adequate composting, recycling processes, construction too large for a lot, and thus too close to a neighbor's home. Uh, I think these are all great points. Um, I think the best way to answer this is that not all of these processes are planning related. And so there is, um, there's definitely, as, you could, as you'll see later in our, in our conversation, there are points that, that come to, um, there are design treatments that we can implement through the objective design standards that um, that will address concerns of transitional design and uh, to reduce the amount of um, a visual and um, a vi visual impact and massing along sensitive, along, along lesser intense, you know, neighboring and, and adjacent uses. So there is nothing in the state law explicitly, but but the state law does allow is for these for communities and SMTO included is to kind of tailor these designs objective design standards to respond to different situations, just as long as they have that track or these standards are drawn out, if that makes sense. And, and Blaze, just to add on that, and I have a question for, for city staff as well. Uh, parking is currently covered by development standards today. So these objective design standards are on top of what is in the code today. And um, that may include something called floor area ratio or lot coverage, and that addresses the concern of being too large for a lot. And um, Wendy or, or Julia, are floor area ratio standards currently in the, the zoning code? Correct. Uh, currently, the parking requirements, um, floor area ratio is under the city's zoning code. Okay. So the, 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 the laws that exist today would not be changed as, as part of this process. This is additive to what exists today. Exactly. I'm gonna get to another chat question. Um, this is about, some, seems like we have a question. Are chat questions available later when reviewing meeting or can question be asked orally by leader so everyone knows what is being asked? So we're gonna go do our best to answer or ask these chat questions out loud, but we'll also have a record of all chat questions um, being asked during this meeting. And this is also recorded as well, so you can go back and view these, these sessions. So, um, if you do have a question, feel free to, to drop it in chat and um, we will do our best to read it out loud. And it sounds like we're having an issue with the Zoom raise, hand raise function from Maxine. So Maxine, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna unmute you right now since, since it seems like you're having a problem doing a hand raise. So I'm gonna see if this works. So let me know if you can uh, speak now, Maxine. And then I'll get to you next, Rocky. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I really just am trying to get straight on how the functionality of this meeting is going. If I want to speak, 
it seems like I have to do a two-part process. And I see some people have yellow hands raised. So doesn't Zoom have a hand raise function? So if somebody wants to speak, they don't have to manually raise their hand or it just seems like it's very inefficient. You have to go to chat and say, I want to speak. But if that's what I have to do, I'm happy to do it. Maxine, if, if you have, a, we're happy to, if you just want to, if you're having trouble doing the hand raise function, um, just say that you have a, a point or a question you want to ask in chat and I'll be sure to, uh, to basically, I, I work the back end of the Zoom meeting here so I can base, I can give you permission to speak. The reason why I just want, we just the reason why I just don't have this open is because we have thirty three participants and we don't want everybody talking over each other. So this is. No, I understand the unmuting, yeah. but you said there is a hand raise function, and if there, so, where is it? There is, yes. So let me, if you go look on the screen right now, it should be, if you click on the manage participants tab. The what? Manage participants. I think probably for guests, it just says participants. Yes, that's true. Yeah. yeah we just, okay. Well, I don't want to waste any more time on the meeting. I'll just say I want to speak in the chat, but um, sounds great. There is some functionality missing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Rocky's indicating um, that on his screen, he might have a, a different, that it, it could yeah. be under the reaction button. So it, uh, uh, yes, yes, it is under the reaction button. There you go. Great. Can you work with it? Thanks, guys. <laughs> yeah, good for everybody. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> and I think Rocky actually has his hands raised. Yeah. Yes. Rocky, that's... I'm on you right now. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Great. I wanted to clarify something you mentioned earlier, Blaze. I believe you mentioned that uh, ministerial review was not available for projects that are invoking the density bonus. Is that correct? Yes, that's how, the, that's how um, we understand it. That's how we interpret the law. And Laura, I'll actually have you speak more to that. Yeah. Um, uh, Rocky, th thank you for bringing that up. I, I want to double check that because it, uh, it's unclear and it seems odd to me. So uh, pretend that you didn't see that and we'll follow up with you. Okay, great. Uh, would love to hear some clarification on that. Thanks for the question. Okay, I think, um, do we have any more questions? Hands raised, chat questions you can get to? Feel free to. And Blaze, this isn't the only time people will have an opportunity. We just wanted to break up the meeting a little bit um, and, and have people weigh in. And we'll, we have uh, lots of other opportunities for you to speak throughout the meeting. All right. Great. So I'm going to move on uh, to the rest, second part of the uh, presentation here. Um, once again, I am going to, okay, I'm going to carry on here. So um, as we dive into the second part here, uh, we're going to be discussing um, design elements um, of multifamily and mixed design um, in, San, in San Mateo. Uh, we've kind of broken this out into eight different categories that we're going to discuss in more detail and then transition to a interactive portion where we will have a live kind of idea board where we put together um, things that you like and don't like about some representative uh, project examples that we have photos of. So just one thing to keep in mind as we look at this right now, um, not one of the, like, these are all kind of, these, all these concepts and elements here, they work together to help, uh, they're all composed to help make these projects uh, work. So site design, is, you know, they can work off elements of streetscape relationship. Massing is important when you're talking about transitional design. Materials articulation can sometimes work with, can work with one another to add interest to uh, building faces. So keep in mind as we go through these, that uh, it's the, all these pieces work together as um, to, uh, to help these projects take, take shape. So when we look at something like site design, and we're going to explain uh, what this is, is 
basically how is a site optimized uh, to make a project work? So how so for a you know how does where does the parking get stored? Where are the where are the access points? How does the building interact with the streetscape? Where does that place? Is it placed along frontages? Is it placed on side streets? Um, and how do these differ between something like a mixed use example that we see on the left and a townhome example that we see on the right? Um, these are all, this is just an example project that was composed for, for something else. So this is not necessarily representative what, of what might be seen in San Mateo, but just something to keep in mind, like as we go through these, how would you help, how would you construct one of these sites and uh, design site design? With massing, this relates to the aesthetics of a of basically building mass. You know, something that you see in like a boxy shape, maybe unmitigated. Um, once you kind of break that mass up into different buildings, into treatments such as step backs, where a maybe a third floor is step back ten feet in order to reduce the presence along a um, along a property line or a street or, or a street. Um, that's a form of modulation of, uh, of building mass and you know, alternating roof lines and heights and multiple structures or other treatments here. So think about as we go through the examples, how, how is massing interacting with some of the project types that we're gonna see in a second. Articulation, this really speaks to what, the, uh, what a building facade looks like. Um, how is that? Are there smaller elements that help add visual interest. Like you can see here in some of these examples, there's, there's plane changes, there's insets for, for balconies. Um, there's also balconies that are offset, um, protruding from the building face. Um, you can see a different array of materials and, um, and awnings actually can provide sh like shade and shadow that provides more visual, visual interest along building faces. So think about these elements when we talk about articulation and how can these are some of them overwhelming? Are some of them make it, are they not enough where it looks too blank? Um, all things to consider as we, as we look at other projects. Materials are also important. They help kind of identify, or not identify, they help kind of you know, speak to the character um, of a, and how a site maybe fits within its context, but also, you know, sometimes a, a lot of materials can can look overwhelming. Um, so I think when we, when we view, when we look at materials, what do we maybe want to see more of in San Mateo? And maybe do we want to see buildings that have kind of more simple color and material palette or, or are we okay with something that looks a bit more lively? So transitional design is a very, um, I, you know, it's a very important topic, I feel. Um, this also, as I said earlier, uh, this can relate to massing and site design, right? Um, Basically, how does a you know project respond and respect to existing you know, development context? If it's next to a, a lower scale neighborhood, such as a you know single family neighborhood, obviously I think there you know there might be treatments to help ensure that there's not overwhelming mass along those uh, along those property lines. Another thing to consider is you know maybe the time of day and the shadow and daylight impacts of uh, of those of those um of those projects and the mass that can occur. So transitional design pretty much speaks to all of those, um, all of those points. A big part of, um, of a, you know, urban design and uh, cultivating good relationships and around streetscapes is, you know, basically paying attention to how are the, how's that frontage being designed? So, you know, around neighborhood streets, are those frontages, do they look more like a, a townhome style? Do they have front yards or stoops? Do they have, are they well landscaped with trees? Do they have individual entrances? You know, maybe in a more downtown setting, are they, do they look more like a, you know, do they have an, an activity zone in front with more glazing? So things to consider as we look at these projects. Open space, um, design, location, and other requirements for amenities that are located within these areas. Um, I think we want to look at both, you know, how, what's the functionality of these spaces and um, the aesthetics, especially maybe along, and maybe I would differentiate them between uh, common and private open spaces as we view some of these, some examples. And then lighting and security, um, often overlooked, but a very important part. Um, 
maybe as we assess these projects, look to how they, how the lighting appears and uh, are there, do they offer good examples of maybe passive eyes on the street? This basically means, uh, is, there, is there good visibility and, and, um, and good, does it, does it look safe? Does it make you feel like it's a welcoming, but also secure for residents? So I'm gonna go dive into a mural presentation here. Um, and uh, what I'll also do is open up the chat function again and um, share with you all what we have here for our mural. And as we hear some uh, input, we're going to uh, record everything. So let me dive in. And I believe Phoenix has been getting these notes down on the mural board from the prior discussion. Is that correct, Phoenix? I'm sorry, what was that? Um, did, did you get some of the, the notes from the, the prior discussion on the mural board? Uh, no, I was waiting for this session to start, okay. but I can always go back to the chat. And yeah. Drop them in. Yeah. yeah, well, uh, I'm just thinking in, in response to the question that was raised by somebody about whether or not the, the chat um, is preserved, we will make sure that we get those questions up on this board as a record of the meeting as well. Absolutely. So let me just orient everyone to this real quick. Um, we have an array of uh, nine different, basically these are multifamily and uh, mixed use developments. So basically what we wanna show is, uh, we wanna go through these one by one and, um, and demonstrate whether or not, uh, we're looking at all these elements we just talked about and basically you wanna get your all's feedback on you know, what, what about this works, what about this doesn't work, is this, would this be a good fit? Um, what can be improved? Just we want to actually leave this as open as possible, um, and uh, let you all just kind of uh, speak freely about whether or not this this could work. So, uh, Blaze, just get... from a just from a pacing standpoint, we've got what eight or nine examples that we want to go through, and, and we've got I mm -hmm. uh, want to allow you know probably t ten minutes or so per. More or less, yeah. I think um, we'll keep it. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be too firm, but I want to, if I think some of these will, uh, we can spend more time on them. I think, you know, I'm getting a request to zoom in. Sure. And um, Maxine, if you have currently up on your screen, people's um, headshots, if you will, your Brady Bunch gallery, you can close that or shrink it down and that'll allow you um, to see the, the, the pictures a little bit better. You, you can um, drag, the, the, the screen over to enlarge it. Are you all able to see this? It's about as quite as zoomed in as I can get. I can see it. And so if somebody has a small screen, oh great, thank you Maxine's good, good to go. Thank you Blaze. Of course. So yeah, I would like to you know open the open the floor if anyone has any any responses to the, to uh, example one over here. Um, we're gonna go through these, we're gonna go through these in order. So start off here. Give up. And what we're looking for is um, you know how would this fit in San Mateo? What what are the things about it that appeal to you? Do not appeal to you? Things that could be um, written as standards. Uh, through uh, where, how the building is placed on the lot, how the building moves, if you will, its articulation. Is, are the mix of materials fine or are there too many materials and colors on, on one? So th those are the types of things. If there's no right or wrong. Um, it, it's everybody's opinion matters. So does somebody want to be bold and be first? Maybe, maybe one of the architects in the crowd. Blaze, I think Seema has her hand up. There may be others, so I'll, I'll go ahead and watch the participant list. Seema, go ahead. I think I just unmuted you. Yeah. Hi, thanks. I guess I'll try to be bold and go first. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I was just going to say, like, this clearly seems to be multifamily housing. Um, and one thing that I see potentially missing is common area. Um, I, I don't know whether it would be in the front or in the rear, but 
you know, like a common front porch or a common gathering area outside where residents could um, interact or socialize. And then um, this feels, I'm, I'm trying not to be, I'm trying to straddle the line between objective and subjective, but you know, accommodating different transportation types, you know, mm -hmm. would, would, would we require bike racks um, in mm -hmm. multifamily housing or would we assume that people would store their bicycles and scooters and whatnot in some sort of indoor storage area? I think from like a articulation and massing standpoint, the, it, it's starting to, to me, again, this feels very subjective, but it's starting to feel to me like a little bit too much busyness between the different planes and the different setbacks. I think somebody mentioned in a few comments ago about between colors and materials and then the facets, not wanting things to feel too overwhelming. And I feel like we've kind of gone in that direction in multifamily mm -hmm. development. So keeping things a little bit more simpler is where I personally would like to see things go, but that feels like a very subjective comment. Thank you. And just to clarify, subjective comments are, are wonderful <laughs> because yeah. I, to, to, we're looking for subjective comments from participants this evening. Thank you. I'm gonna go move on to Monique. So I'm gonna unmute. You should be able to speak freely here. Yes, um, I'm just gonna speak from an owner, a long-term holder perspective. Um, I think this would be beautiful, a beautiful building for the first like year, maybe year and a half, but it looks like the wood is gonna, over time, if not maintenance correctly, be a, a problematic. So um, mm -hmm. that's the first thing that comes up for me. It's materials. maybe discouraging um, materials that will degrade um, quickly in um, in the in the future. Okay. So high quality materials is yeah, it's a very important project long for the longevity of aesthetics. So that's a, that's a great point. Thank you. And, and just um, Blaze, I wanted to note to Phoenix that we've got a, a comment in the chat that you might be able to copy and, and put up on the board when you get a chance. Awesome. I'm gonna go to Rocky. Um, should be able to unmute. You know if you can. I think that this is an elegant example of multifamily that uh, looks like it's uh, using the modern farmhouse aesthetic and doing it uh, with the appropriate components of what a modern farmhouse is, with simple geometry, with uh, changes in plane with the scale and even uh, just shaded porch areas. Uh, it's difficult to see if there are missing elements because it looks like a crop photo and it looks like a uh, landscape with the use of the pot still there. Looks like it's still in process of completing this project. But um, I, I, I feel like it's, it's done a good job of using restraint in the palette of colors, materials, and the composition, uh, doing a good job of placing something that uh, has modern flair, but also would be compatible in a more traditional neighborhood. Well, thank you. Great, great input. Okay. So I'm gonna move to Adam. Should be able to, there you go. Yes, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, I would say when I, when I look at this, um, I put on a couple of different hats. So the materials in this look like probably hardy board and some wood. Um, the, the materials have a, like harken back to a traditional um, aesthetic. And so in many of our neighborhoods were pretty much built out and preserved at like a certain stage of architectural design. So, um, you know, depending on, on the year, you can kind of go to a neighborhood and know what year or what decade that was built. Mm -hmm. And so when you, when you can incorporate similar materials, um, 
to what the neighborhood context is with, with the new development. Um, I think that's, that's helpful for people to accept the, the change. Um, one thing that I see from a, from a design perspective that, that, you know, overall, I don't want to like, I don't want to nitpick that this design, but some of the things that I, I like to look at that are from a more vernacular standpoint, um, like from any culture is that generally being able to find the front door um, is really important because it indicates that human life uh, lives there. Also, you know, making sure that there's balance. Now balance can be achieved in multiple ways, but I think a lot of people that live in the more older neighborhoods of San Mateo are gonna wanna try to get balance that was, that was created um, through symmetry or some sort of um, asymmetrical balance that, you know, sometimes modern architecture tries to create a little bit of discord against just to be, you know, unique. Um, and so trying to find ways to define what balance means for different neighborhoods um, and, you know, be able to tie it back to the, the neighborhood context of, you know, hey, this is mostly Spanish uh, mission style homes. So how, what are the, what are the balances, what, what, what gives them balance and how do we recreate that for uh, incrementally different homes um, and buildings. So just being able to get what is kind of the, the essence of the style in a neighborhood and then being able to recreate it at, at scale through design standards. So right. that's kind of what I see with this. This, oh. this design doesn't really tell me much. It looks like it's a little postmodern because it's a hodgepodge of you know modern design and and traditional materials, which you know it's kind of ho hum to me. It's it's not really striking in in any one direction. So great. I like your point about about the the, the doorways. I mean that's that's a I mean, I mean to me that speaks to the street, streetscape relationship and how. Um, it is, you know, it does seem like a home when you're able to see those entrances along a, along a, you know, a public corridor. So it speaks, it helps, I think, it, you know, maybe help anchor, you know, fits well in a particular context. Thanks, Adam. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna go move to Travis. I was gonna say uh, something very similar to what Rocky said. He said it much more eloquently than I. Um, I, I just say that as a multifamily this is a very low density of units and would look very appropriate at a low density in you know, much of the neighborhoods. I, you know, I'm not here to talk about architectural styling. I think it's attractive. And um, thinking about objective design standards, the setback, the relationship to the street trees, uh, pedestrian pathway, and then a landscape buffer is quite um, approachable. Um, and then sort of plus one to Rocky's comments on modern take on traditional design and um, the elegance of, you know, what is a, a modern take on a very historic type of home. Great. Awesome. Oh, well, please, great, great input, everyone. Yeah, there, there was a comment from um, Diane, and I know that Phoenix is probably going to put it, put it up there, but she, she's indicating she'd like to know how the garage driving parking are handled. And my, my guess is it's probably from an alley loaded. Uh, don't know for sure, but that just looking at it, it doesn't look like there's any relation, um, car relationship to the street. Mm -hmm. yeah, great point. Yeah, this, these are, these are just, you know, small vignettes and snapshots of, of different projects. Um, you'll, you know, see some of these examples, there'll be some variation in what you see and you'll, those, the accessibility, especially with driveways and garages will be, will be more evident than the other examples. But that's a great point. Blaze, I think some of the key, the key takeaways from the comments that uh, folks have made, and this is what's so difficult to put into an objective design standard document, is context matters. And to make sure that something fits within the neighborhood, that it's in either by style or by um, the, the scaling, the massing, the setbacks. And, and so that's something that's going to have to be captured 
uh, as, as well as the, the use of materials. And it, it's not, the standards would not dictate materials, but as you had mentioned, it needs to mention durable materials or maybe, uh, you know, no more than five different materials on, a, on one building. So um, these are great comments, everybody. It, 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 the, the, the difficulty is going to be translating these into more black and white rather than gray areas. Yeah. Yeah, we had a comment about you know subjective input. Yeah, that's, that's part of the challenge here. You know, how do we how do we capture all that and kind of run it through the machine and translate it into something that's objective? But that's you know, that's why we're all here. So, so yeah, this is all great comments. Really appreciate everyone. Um, we're going to move on to the next example unless there's some, any you know parting words. For example, number one number over here. I think uh, we did a good job. Fantastic. Okay, so I'm going to click and drag, and we're going to go look at. Example number two, a little bit more, maybe I would say bold, a more daring as far as roof forms go. Um, I think we see, uh, I think we, you know, we see those garages. We see this is clearly, you know, this is like a duplex or triplex. Uh, we don't see, you know, maybe the other, other side of the building, but um, we'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on maybe, you know, looking at, at the, Last last example, and then this one, where some uh, what kind of stands out as you know as a uh, contrasting, or maybe doing things a little bit better, or maybe does this not work as well? So looking forward to maybe hearing some uh, some thoughts on for number two here. We have a yeah, and we have a raised hand. Here we go, Miss Rowinski. Yeah, hi. Um, hi. I'm going to bring up something that hasn't been brought up before, and it's just from a personal experience. Um, and that is uh, bird strikes on glass. Um, we recently had a couple of bird strikes here at our house and did some research. And according to U.S. Federal uh, Fish and Wildlife, roughly about a billion birds a year collide with windows, and most of those collisions happen at homes and buildings shorter than four stories. And that might be an interesting design perspective um, to consider in terms of what can be done to reduce bird strikes. Um, for example, according to U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, ultraviolet pattern glass can be installed, channel glass. So there appears to be lots of remedies, simple remedies that could be built into um, some of these designs. This one comes to mind um, that could be worth considering. And I would be glad to forward to anyone the website um, on, from U.S. Fish and Wildlife. If, so, if you could put that in the chat, that would be great. Okay, we'll do. Great, um, great, great input, great comment. You know, it's it's one of those, it's one of those things that you don't like. Frank, it gets overlooked a lot. So that's a wonderful. You brought that up. Really appreciate it. Great comment. So we have another comment from Diane Whitaker. Hardscape. And garage doors dominate the street facade at ground level. Not a very appealing first impression. So maybe it's also talking to the streetscape relationship a bit with, with that um with that comment. And Blaze, it looks uh, like it looks like um, Keith had, had a similar comment with regard to the garages on yeah. the bottom, they're not very in inviting. Yep, not, yeah, it's like Luke San Mateo. The garage doors too prominent, slanted roofs, clunky, seems very boxy, imposing. So um, let's speak, I think again, um, echoing that comment about the garage and uh, maybe it's overwhelming on that streetscape relationship, but also speaking to the massing and how this roof forms, maybe maybe they're not a good fit. Maybe they're, maybe they're too... Maybe it's too, the scale is off, especially since maybe this looks like a you know this residential neighborhood. Maybe this is this is too intense, or, or not intense, but maybe just it's just too it's too boxy. Good comment. We have another comment from uh, some SEMA. It feels pretty busy with the number of materials, colors, and planes. Five. I think we have a 
five count on the facade and three different kinds of wood. I think, yeah, it's great, great comment. There's a lot, there's a, seems like there's a lot going on here. Great observation. I'm gonna call, have Adam, you have a your hand raised, so you should be able to unmute now. Sure, sure. So this this building reminds me, or makes me think of recent movement and more modern architecture to articulate <laughs> buildings for the sake of articulation. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think if we do want to have articulation as a design standard, we need to have it be purposeful and not overly, overly um, arbitrary. Um, and often, you know, the thing I, I look back at, at uh, well, where are the great um, mixed use environments in the US and, and elsewhere. And they tend to be older neighborhoods, so pre-war neighborhoods where, you know, massing was mixed. You're not gonna, you're gonna have a one-story house and three-story, you know, Victorian, you know. So the massing itself of this three-story building is not, is not the problem. I think it's really the design. Um, and so often people love older streetscapes. Um, there are a mixture of neighborhoods in San Mateo, so different eras that were built. So this comment is, is going to come more looking at the pre-war neighborhoods. Um, but it would be nice if we could have some sort of objective design standard that says if you take a facade that was developed um, anywhere in the world before 1940, and you want to recreate it with the window placement and door placement, porch placement, um, up to you know X number percent difference in terms of window sizes. I think a lot of people in many neighborhoods, and especially downtown, would would love that. If you know, we don't need to have new architecture if we can use something that was designed or or play off of something that was designed in 1915. Um, uh, I think, you know, many people would be very happy with that and would be much more uh, open to change uh, in terms of intensity if they can see stuff that are more or less proven, proven, <laughs> proven to be liked um, by uh, no, numerous studies in psychological and sociological research from an architecture perspective. Um, so I'm just putting that out there, like, um, again, San Mateo has a number of neighborhoods that were not all built before the war, um, mm -hmm. but for those perhaps that were, um, getting objective design standards that um, pretty, you know, pretty much can reference existing um, traditional buildings form, um, I think a lot of people would like that. Um, and it's being able to, use, for architects to be able to pick or create um, elevations of existing buildings, whether it's in San Francisco or Kyoto, I don't, it doesn't matter. Um, but, you know, people, there is a reason they developed like that and, you know, mm -hmm. nothing against modern architecture. It's, it's, it's just people like that. So getting something that, that um, can reference the traditional building style I think would be an amazing thing for uh, San Mateo to kind of get over a lot of friction. Great. Great comment. I, I, really, I really like what stood out to me is the articulation for the sake of articulation. That, uh, that's a very strong uh, comment and uh, great analysis there. So um, yeah, fantastic, appreciate it. Thanks, Adam. And we have a comment, say so agree with Adam and San Mateo has a has many great examples of multifamily large units looking around, look around Main Library on Fourth Avenue. So, fantastic. Um, I'm gonna go Seema, raised hand. So, seems like you uh, should be able to speak. Are you able to, are you able to unmute? Oh, there you go. I think that's set up. Hi, thanks again. Um, so, one thing that I noticed about this multifamily design is that there's not a lot of um, enablement of 
sort of outdoor activity. You know, one thing that's really great about San Mateo is we have this amazing weather pretty much year round. And I think what people like about those pre-war buildings is that there's a central courtyard or there's, you know, balconies or there's patios that um, people can make use of. And so if there's any way to encourage, if we're gonna do multiple heights of roofs, maybe encourage roof decks or, you know, encourage central courtyards, encourage balconies, like, allow people to be able to enjoy the outdoor space and the outdoor weather. Good comment. Speaking to, I think, speaks to that front front yard streetscape relationship, which also, you know, open space too. It's functional. It seems like this example might be lacking both, both departments there. Do we have any other um, comments for this, uh, for example number two, we'll move on. Plus, we have a comment in the chat, plus one to design standards that encourage roof decks, balconies, and courtyards. All right, I'm going to move on to example number three here. So we are looking at a very different building here. Um, scale is a little bit, you know, we're increasing in scale here. Uh, a lot of glazing along the facade, some variation in the roof line, but you know we have we have we have some articulation. Um, definitely different ground floor, and frankly, just very different context from the past two examples. So, be uh, interested to hear what you how you all react to uh, to this specific example here, and I can zoom in a little too. I'm afraid people are stunned, Blaze. Don't be the case. Oh, we have Monique. Here we go. Thank you. I didn't mean to hit the clapped one. I am not clapping at that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Um, no, no problem. I'm just gonna type this up, but it's just too long. Um, the biggest thing that I see is that um, while it fits a lot of the modern architecture that we're starting to see, it does not look functional for the residents inside as far as being able to have places to put their furniture and everything because it's all um, window frontage. Mm -hmm. And what I have seen in a lot of the buildings that are coming up like this is that people tend to either keep their blinds closed all the time and then have their furniture um, over their blinds or they have furniture or things in the window that starts to um, give a lot of other character to the building. So mm -hmm. um, that's just my, my number one comment. And then the other aspect is just, um, there's, a, there's not a lot of, uh, the streetscape is very unappealing. Mm -hmm. That's it. Great. Good com Great. Thank you so much, Monique. Good comments. I think uh, it's almost like you know, over effort to make an open face, which causes people to kind of the, the tenants to close themselves off more with the, with the blinds and such. Good comment. Thank you. Um, we have a couple in the chat here. Uh, too much glass. Uh, I don't get the stucco zigzags um, from Keith in the comments, uh, in the chat rather. Um, Rocky, I'm gonna go ask you to unmute. Uh, yes, I, I wanna echo that it, it's a bit of an unfriendly building. Um, I try to look at the lens of uh, especially multifamily projects to see whether they are strengthening community in terms of both uh, their own community, but also are they elevating the sense of community around the context that they're in? And I think, unfortunately, this uh, strategically looks like it's trying to call attention to itself as sort of a beacon, not necessarily uh, relating to its context. Aesthetically, it kind of reminded me of Wallace and Gromit 
it has sort of that, uh, that claymation face uh, along the facade. Um, uh, and I, and I want to just kind of echo the, the sort of streetscape, um, although it, it has storefront, uh, it, it could really use, uh, I think, more landscape and sort of more fine grain elements mm -hmm. to really help uh, create a more pedestrian friendly and human scale uh, sort of front door. And um, I think someone else mentioned too much glass. Yeah, it, it, it really could be, I think, strengthened with um, a better balance of um, material, solid and void, uh, and uh, and really just something to um, uh, hint at life, where people are gathering, where uh, there's shared spaces and uh, and the like. It it seems very cold. Great, great comments, Rocky. Thank you. I'm going to go on to Swarovski here. Okay. Hi. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to say a comment here. Um, I used to, uh, I I used to for business travel to the former, um, former East Germany. Um, which was part of the Soviet bloc. And it reminds me of the architecture that I have seen in the former East. Um, blocky, glassy, uh, inhumane, uh, doesn't fit in context with its environment. Um, so when I saw it, that's what it reminded me of. And uh, I agree with Rocky's comments, but I also, since I bought up the bird strikes on the prior um, design, I just want to also mention um, one of the items that enhances bird strikes is a lot of glass, but a lot of glass that's lit. Uh, birds are attracted to that. And you have right in the middle of this building um, a four or five story hunk piece of glass that's lit that could be a perfect target um, mm -hmm. for the birds. So, and it's it talks about Lit, you know, lighting um, within the context of strikes and the length that I had sent off. Great points. Yeah, this is, yeah, centerpiece is just, yes, yeah, this illuminated column of that warm lighting it seems to almost like can call out, right? <clears throat> Great comments. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read a few more from the chat. We have, um, from SEMA, the streetscape could be better, uh, could better support the community, protected bicycle, walking lane, greenery, tables, and chairs. Except for the first floor. Um, from Maxine, the lighted, don't like, does not like the lighted center stairwell, it impacts non-residents, too much glass. And then from Diane, it's too busy, articulation and color is not working. We have a raised hand from Travis. I'm gonna call on you. Yeah, I, I'm trying not to be subjective, um, which we're getting a lot of. Uh, so one thing I'll note is on the corner here, it, what looks to be a retail space, I'll, I'll just note that flexibility, uh, a lot of cities in the last 20 years have, have sort of requiring retail based on every frontage along a street. Um, and you get a lot of this empty retail spaces, even though it appears all the units here are close to occupied. Um, so a flexibility in design criteria that allows for quote unquote active uses to include, you know, as many different types of retail and, you know, where it makes sense, residential on the ground floor as an active use should be considered. Great, good comment. Thank you. Um, was there anything else for this uh, example number three? So, oh, one more, I think, of Adam before we move on. Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on that last comment um, where I'm um, having some sort of flexibility with retail. There's definitely a good amount of street life that, that retail helps 
um, promote, especially when it's continuous. Um, when it is broken up, um, often what ha- what works well um, for transitional neighborhoods, you know, older neighborhoods like in Washington D.C., mm-hmm. is where you have little gardens or little planted areas um, could be vertical gardens in a modern context um, to provide kind of a, a softness and texture um, in visual interest. That's that's a pedestrian scale. So, you know, thinking about um, creating little little pocket gardens. They don't have to be huge, but just something of interest in greenery that's that's naturally appealing to people. Um, if there isn't a retail establishment, there's just some some way we need to maintain a, a continuous, interesting uh, lower level mm-hmm. for pedestrians. So um, having some sort of way to do that that's flexible would be important in the in the standards. Just your relationship. Great. Good comment. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna do one more uh, for this, then we have to move on. I'm trying to hopefully I'll, I want to pick up the pace a little bit. Um, just to let you know we we can't we will send everything out after so there will be additional um, opportunities to leave uh, comments on these uh, on these examples. So I'm gonna call on Jordan. Yeah, uh, I'll keep this brief. Um, you know, I, I pretty much disagree with with all of the complaints that I've that I've heard about the building. Um, there's really a lot of futility in this entire exercise because I, I personally didn't care for the for the first example, the one that that looked you know a lot like a single family home, um, but a lot of other people did, and and this is very very subjective. Um, that said, I really like the glass a lot. I, I think a lot of light is important when you're living in the part in you know a smaller space like an apartment. Um, I do agree with Adam. Um, I think the design could include more greenery on the on the ground floor. Um, I also think it could you know include greenery. We've got uh, a building downtown um, that's really nice that uh, has plants that are trained to grow up the wall. And so I think something like that could be really nice to, um, to provide some more greenery uh, just on the building overall. And then um, that, that's pretty much it. I, I really disagree that it in any way calls to mind East German architecture um, as someone who, who lived and studied there. Um, that, that's not at all what East German architecture looks like. Um, but but that's, really, that's really it for me. Thanks. Thank you for the comments, Jordan. I uh, really appreciate it. It's great to get a lot of people's input here. Um, and, and Blaze, I think Jordan's pointing out the difficulty of objective design standards. It's, it's yeah. going to be tough to find standards that are going to create buildings that appeal to everybody. Um, and and the, the city may find itself with a lot of projects going through discretionary review because people will want to, to riff on the themes or on, on the regulations that are put before them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is, you know, we're very, this is a very early stage in this process. So this is really just kind of getting a pull, you know, just to read the pulse about what to, to what you all think in the community and what can fit. So this is all helpful. Um, I, I, you know, a lot of this is definitely subjective, but we, I, you know, I, this, when we, when, we, when we actually put this all together, you know, we're, we can find some objective standards coming out of this. So this, I, I think it's been, this has been very helpful. Um, I'm gonna move on to the example number four. Um, right. A little bit different development here. Uh, show some context, show some show some streetscape life. Uh, does anybody, I would like to hear any responses to this uh, particular, oh, and I can zoom in a little. Better look. You can see there's, there's some, you know, there's some changing roof lines. Um, there are some articulating elements, awnings over the windows on the fourth floor. Uh, there's a you know, some there's a you know an array of materials happening here. 
there's some street trees, but maybe not a lot of open, open, you know, ground floor activity, ground floor, uh, you know, environment happening along along the units, um, on that face, on the building face toward on the uh, right side. Um, Blaze, I think going to the right down the block, presuming this is all part of the same development, it looks like they've made an attempt to have it look like different types of buildings, even though you see the design scene with, with the Juliet balconies extending down along yeah. the second floor there. And they, got a, they got a bargain on earth tone paints in white. Yeah. I wasn't going to mention the paint, but I like the earth tones. They're warm. Um, <laughs> thanks for the Laura. Uh, what I was going to say is actually that I, I was re responding to, to Blaze's comment about the sort of lack of the ingress egress on the right hand side. It, it feels like there should be entries to those units there. It doesn't look like there are. And I, I was, again, going back to your, your list before about site security and safety and um, trying to balance security and safety with. Uh, having ground floor access. I, I'm not sure I have an opinion on that, but something to consider sort of the trade-off. And Laura, I think, mentioned it in, in passing, and I'll just, I want to put a plug in that the idea of, of saying you must do seven of these 10 things appeals to a sense of flexibility. And there's going to be times where doing more of one thing presents less of another and, and allowing people to take advantage of those those trade-offs in the way that makes sense for their project is super attractive. So I'll, I'll just put a plug in for sort of not having to do every single box checked, but a, um, a menu of options that you have to meet a certain number uh, is, is sort of deeply appealing. Great, great comment. Very helpful. Some flexibility preserved in that that approach. Certainly. Um, I'm gonna go Sima. Here we go. Hi, I was just gonna note that I'm I'm not personally a fan of faux functionality. So those those Juliet balconies, it doesn't. It implies there's a balcony there, but there isn't. You know, you can't step mm -hmm. out onto it. I don't even know if you could open those windows or or swing them open. So um, I would encourage real <laughs> balconies or just in general, um, don't imply things through design or imply functionality through design that don't actually exist. Um, I disagree with the comment that it's not friendly looking. I, I think my opinion, it's warm and it seems to match in with its surroundings. Um, but I do think you could highlight the entrance more. There was, I think Adam made a comment previously about making sure it's clear People know where to go in and you know having a, a, a large inviting entrance can create that sense of hospitality and welcome. Great so speaking a little bit to some functionality of the open space I mean it's very small but private open space option for the balcony I mean it's kind of like articulation for articulation's sake right like right. coming to add that earlier it's I think it plays off that so yeah very good points thank you. Um, I'm gonna, Adam, have you, should be on you, there you go. Sure, sure. So for this one, um, there's, there's portions of the building that, that you see, notice that there's kind of a symmetrical arrangement of the windows and the windows are, um, especially that white portion on the left and the windows are vertically placed. Um, that tends to be um, quite psychologically beneficial to humans. Like they see faces in, in architecture often. Um, it's just a natural thing. And so having, you know, as an element in, in buildings where the, the building, build, the windows um, can be or can be encouraged to be symmetrically located and um, vertically oriented. Um, is often very um, well received by people. Um, you see that throughout a lot of vernacular architecture. Mm -hmm. um, and so this often, you know, it's comfortable for a lot of people. You can have pretty large windows in doing that. 
Um, so that's, that's a nice element. It's not always necessary, but it's a nice element. Um, and then again, see what Seema said, the, the door, it's really hard to find. Like if you look at um, like Draper University or any, or any other older building, uh, the doors are very easy to find. So it really speaks to where that pedestrian is supposed to go. So we really, really want to cut down on confusion as far as where you're supposed to go and what you're supposed to do. Like, what's the purpose? Um, where am I going? So, and then the other thing to note that just a critique of this building is that the, at the street level, the um, materials are a little bit in the windows and just what's going on is a little bit flat, a little bit plain. Um, so you typically, you often see um, well pedestrian scale buildings have, you know, something above the first floor that can be continuous for X number of floors, but at the lower, at the, at the street level floor, um, there's just more detail, more visual interest. And there's, they're kind of doing that, but I think that um, it, it could be, enhanced um, beyond just a, a new paint job and a new pattern. Um, and so getting a, an objective way to define that, whether it's reference to existing, um, existing precedents or um, some other way to, way to define that could be helpful, especially on a corner building, mm -hmm. uh, which is very prominent from across uh, many different vantage points. Right. That's my two cents. If you can <laughs> get that into a objective standard that doesn't require review, <laughs> mm -hmm. well, that would be great. Try to capture as much, much as we can, but yeah, it's great input mm -hmm. regardless. So really appreciate it again. Um, a couple of comments in the chat. Articulation is good. Massing is okay. Color palette needs more work. Streetscape is minimal. Top of building could use more articulation at the long flat wall sections. And the pedestrian entry needs to be celebrated and easy to find. So a couple of, uh, you know, we have some, some uh, synergy there. Uh, another comment saying massing articulation work in the situation, large windows, but still plenty of wall surface. Spare but appealing, like the corner treatment, but entry is weak. So another, you know, we're seeing more of that those were the building entries being more prominent. So, you know, we're getting a lot of common themes here. I'm gonna have Rocky go next and then we're gonna go move into the next uh, next example. Uh, we'll try before, to keep... before we go to Rocky, just real fast, Maxine had a, a prior comment that I wanna make, uh, uh, Phoenix, if you've caught that at 7.19 PM, if you could scroll up, make sure that we've captured that from Maxine, that would be great. My apologies, Maxine. I'll do. Thanks, Phoenix. All right, Rocky, thank you. No problem. Uh, just real briefly, um, I think that the one way to look at the building facades is to see as the, as the sun hits it, where are the shadows coming from? And it looks like there's just a kind of a dearth of where porosity and, and that type of light and dark contrast is happening. So that sort of echoes to some of the other comments of, of uh, the flatness of, of the building. It, I, I almost wanna see um, the first floor be just completely different and it's okay from the second floor and up. It really uh, could use some, some uh, TLC on the blankness of the walls. And um, I can just imagine it not to be the most, um, easy walk, walking around the block on this building. And, um, and you know, just having, what makes a, a project great for communities also just, uh, I think people mentioned entrances, but also just um, the chance that you might see somebody who lives there or uh, more opportunities for um, social collisions where people can meet each other, somebody's dog is, um, you know, friendly and, and you want to pet it, you know, those types of things don't seem to be ready-made in this type of environment. Uh, 
Awesome, great comment, thank you. Let me just uh, state, we had Maxine's comment, oh, I'm sorry. Maxine's comment, the relationship of window size to solid building elements will be important. Details here will be critical. This example has large windows, but doesn't feel like an all glass building. And then we have from Jordan, over articulated on the bottom, the lighted center stairwell looks great. So I think we will go move on to the next example here. Yes. Okay, so we have example five. Actually, let me just go back. We have a. Yes, yeah, so Seema had a, had a comment, for example, for the, the green space in the final product turned out much nicer than in the render. And the mature, mature trees really help, and with the bike racks. So, yeah, there's, you know, there's, there's some. This is a project you can see before, you know, was new. So, some, you know, those. And the trees grow and obviously changes the overall appearance a bit. So good, great point, point that out. Please on this one, it, um, yeah, look, heavy. We, we're doing a color palette. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say this is a, also from a different, you know, this is a, the way this is photographed, all from a different angle. It, it's a lot more the perspective is a bit more um more intense here as far as like you know, the, the, taking with a you know wider camera angles. I think we'll you know we'll see some elements accentuated a bit, but um yeah, it would be great, great to hear what you all think of uh maybe the material composition as Laura pointed out. And per somebody's question from earlier, is this a low mid rise or, or high rise? Certainly not a, not a high rise building. It follows um, kind of in between. It's only three stories. It falls in between low and mid. Mm -hmm. Thoughts, questions, comments? Even a couple of quick ones, and, and Blaze, I don't know if we're going to get to, to all eight examples. What we might do is, um, if one is particularly different than the others, we might want to jump to that. I'm, why is everybody stymied on this one? Okay, Adam. Yeah, we got him. <laughs> all right, am I muted? I'm, I'm, okay. I think it should be good. Yeah. Okay. So the only the only comment I have is um, with regard to balcony space. Uh, I think that we can overdo balcony space often um, where it's not actually used. I'd much rather get more light into buildings um, and focus more on communal outdoor space um, in a building like this. Uh, you know, it's nice to be able to put some stuff on a balcony, but often, you know, studies have shown that, you know, they get used very little. Um, and so just, we should be, be careful about not overdoing our requirements for balcony space. And that's all I have for this one. Would you say that there's, so this, this is a case where it's overdone then, Adam, is, is, there's too much. Uh, not, not necessarily. Uh, you know, for this one in particular, I would say that that in general, the you kind of lose the connection with the balcony on the corner. I like um, between the the building and stuff. It it kind of makes the building recede, mm -hmm. and it's not quite as in. It's actually not quite as inviting as having the balcony say on the on the left side, where it just becomes more of a actual functional massing breakup. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas these, these balconies on the corner, you know, 
porches are great. I mean, there's some great triple deckers in, in the Boston area that do do this kind of thing, but um, they're not wrap around three stories. Um, I just I just see the depth of them. It's not that functional of space. Like you'd get just the same amount of functionality probably from the residents for the for the ones on the left on in the in the mm -hmm. middle of the building than you would on this. So again, it's, the comment is just basically let's not overdo balcony space. Um, mm -hmm. Let's try to get you know, more you know make better use of the space for furnishing and like interior space that people can have an extra bedroom. Great. And please, Diane um, Whitaker made a comment that uh, I'm going to interpret, and Diane, maybe, maybe you can expound on this, but she's, she's saying that a lot of money was put into the corner element. I, I think what that leads to is we need to make sure that buildings have what everybody calls four-sided architecture. Don't just pretty up the thing that most people see, but you really need to make sure that all faces of the building are treated with some um, interesting treatments. Yeah, I mean, I would I would say the 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 street facing portions are are much more important mm -hmm. to focus on, um, you know, because that's what people are going to see. If you want to do, if you want to have a party in the back, <laughs> not quite as I don't quite care. Great, thanks, thank you, Adam. Um, I'm gonna read off a few more comments in the chat. Um, Seems like, you know, we have a comment from Keith, maybe it's the angle of the photo, but the balcony seemed to weaken the corner, perhaps less balcony would enhance the massing. Um, it's, you know, another comment from Seema, I personally, she likes this aesthetic, uh, color palette works well together with not a ton of contrast in colors. It's light and bright and uh, lots of balcony for people to enjoy the outdoors. Um, sounds like we have a, looks like we have a, another raise hand from Rocky. Um, I think this project does a better job than some of the other examples in terms of having a little bit more articulation and porosity between outside and inside. Uh, however, I, I, my critique on it is um, I kind of feel like the materials and the colors uh, could use um, a little bit more um, adjustment in the balance of proportions, it seems like there's almost an even proportion of all these different colors and, and materials, as opposed to having something that's primary and then something that's secondary and maybe accents. And, uh, you know, so I think that that part would, would I think, really strengthen it. Um, you know, I echo some of the other comments that were made about uh, having uh, sort of uh, an extremely large um, kind of wraparound corner. Uh, it, it just seems like, you know, if you're going to use accent color, if you're going to use a certain material, um, maybe it should highlight certain areas or, or call, to, call to attention the uniqueness or how special uh, mm -hmm. certain portions of the building are as opposed to just uh, sort of evenly distributing everything. That's my comment. Great. So like maybe a splash of variation there in, in a way. Is that it captures it? Great. Um so we have a oops, like Rocky like might have, might have been muted. Rocky, I'm gonna unmute you in one second. Hold on. You got cut off there. Uh, I'm sorry, you, you had a, a follow-up question? Yeah, I was, gonna, I was gonna say, it sounds like some variation around, around elements of the building that maybe would be accented more. Uh, like color and material. Yeah, I just feel like the, the colors and the materials are almost evenly distributed, it seems mm -hmm. like to me, proportionally. And the, the project I think would be strengthened a lot if there was something that was more primary. And then, uh, you know, being able to identify secondary and tertiary materials and colors. I think there could be a little bit more contrast also. Um, it seems like very similar values of the colors. Great, thank you. Just wanna clarify, really appreciate it. 
Um, a couple more written comments. Sounds like we have uh, you know, Maxine, wonder, wonderful people who use balcony to enjoy, to enjoy outdoors and maybe have plants, but often balconies are used as closets for storage. Um, well, you know, that's evidence in a lot of places where balconies are present. Um, Jordan has a comment, really likes the balconies here. Ideally, they'd be allowed but not required. Not crazy about how far the building is set back from the street, taking valuable space away from adding more units. Feels a little over articulated. And then another comment from Sima if you could walk up to the first floor corner balcony, that would be nice. So maybe there's, if there's a direct access to some of these units on the first floor. Great. Um, I'm going to go move on to the next next project. Unless there's any final words about uh, about example number number five now. Number five here. Wait, well, I think there was a request uh, from staff maybe to to switch to eight. Yeah, I re I rearranged it. So we're actually going to go to example number. I, I put switch eight in place of six. So we're going in order. Um, but yeah, this is a uh, this is a project. Um, we wanted to throw this one in here. This is a a lot of you know upper floor articul articulation and modulation to the mats. You know, a lot of step backs, a lot of awnings, ch plane changes, roof line changes. Seems like uh, you know for, you know if you look closely, you can see there's a lot of material, a lot of different materials being used here. Um, with, I believe actually this project is also mixed use. So ground floor retail um, with uh, residential above. Any uh, reactions to this project? Looks like we have a raised hand already from Travis. Hello, so um, again with the retail, um, Oftentimes, this looks like it was mandated to do a material differentiation um, to sort of isolate or, or provide unique opportunities for the for the retail below. I, in my mind, this is not working. Um, it's too many materials on the ground floor, um, and I think that's sort of uh, over designed in some way. Um, so I think sort of n not mandating material changes as retail um, is a good idea generally, and then. Similarly, uh, the, the step back at the second level appears effective. The, the sort of third mm -hmm. level setback and then the fourth level setback, it's, it's, it's too much. Uh, it feels like the, the building's sort of fading away. So giving people the opportunity to sort of uh, incorporate a, a setback if, if it, it makes sense, but and sort of not mandating this cascading effect, I think just really weakens the overall uh, approach of the building. Great comments, uh, Travis. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, this one's this one's definitely a departure from some of the other examples that we've had. So, you know, this is exact kind of exactly the kind of comment we're looking for, looking for. So, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go for Rocky here. So, should be able to unmute. I want to echo uh, what Travis had said. It does uh, seem to suffer from. Uh, sort of an exuberance of, of materials and, and stepping and, and whatnot. Um, I, I think that uh, when we have environments that are zoned for mixed use or, uh, or other pedestrian friendly uses, it's important to have zoning that's flexible that I think really the goal for most communities is to have a pedestrian friendly environment that's activated and not static. And especially uh, in, in these challenging times of, of the retail and commercial environment, um, you've, you've got to have flexibility in what constitutes a storefront or what constitutes a use that's allowable down at the ground level that really does the job of activating as opposed to mandating a particular type of use, like a retail establishment or something. Um, we've done projects where a large lobby space is activated because there's a coffee kiosk there and there's plenty of seating and there's outdoor space and it really creates an atmosphere that's pedestrian friendly because it has elements that uh, are to the scale of the human. 
uh, it, but it doesn't necessarily have a commercial license or, or use. It's, um, so I, I just want to make, mm -hmm. echo that uh, it's important to, to have the flexibility to, because uh, it's better to have an activated pedestrian friendly space than to have a non-leased space mm -hmm. where a, a retail establishment does not feel like it's worth going there. This is a question, your, your comments really just capturing, you know, flexi you know flexibility of, of that ground floor, especially in mixed use. So you're know, looking at, from the standpoint of creating objective standards, I think I mean, it sounds like a, this might more apply more to the zoning, but I definitely think we can maybe try to capture the, the design through, through how, how we put these objective standards together. Yeah, great comment though, uh, Rocky, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go to Adam, looks like you're unmuted, so go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, I do wanna second or third the, the <laughs> notes about the step backs. Mm -hmm. uh, I think step backs are way overused. You go to, you go to, traditional walkable places and they're almost non-existent um, if there's really an issue with sun sometimes it's especially with the warming climate might be too much sun um, you know I want to make sure that there's good light for trees at the pedestrian level um, but step backs for step back sakes are can be just absurd it, it, I mean we have plenty of great traditional architecture that that fits well and is you know larger in mass next to other stuff and that doesn't require a step back to um, be in a be you know contextually sensitive it has to do with being similar styles um, and then separate from the step back comment um, I would say that the windows here are too receded they're not the prominent articulated thing. And when we um, design buildings, we should have windows and doors be what get most of the, the design elements, the trim, um, all that, all that, um, you know, that minor detail should really focus on windows, doors, and edges, like cornices, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, because it really, um, is psychologically, I mean, this is studied psychologically, um, that people see eyes, they see faces, and the windows having the most detail is, is the most bang for your buck. Um, if you're if you're a developer trying to spend money wisely, make the windows prominent. There's just a lot of blank walls, and then the windows are hidden. It just like that's that's contrary. You're, you're just wasting um, your space. So window focus, door focus, details. Um, and, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of ways we can write it, but uh, I think that that kind of needs to be a baseline for how we, how we design buildings. <laughs> that's, that's psychologically appropriate. Great. Thanks, Andy. That's great. I, I really like the insights that you're presenting on, uh, on, on windows. And I think, you think you know, subconsciously a lot of people, how people you know, assess sites and the aesthetics of, of a building plays, in, plays into the, um, into the, how they, the perception and, uh, and basically how they look. So I think these are, this is very useful to capture in, um, in, this, in these comments. So I really appreciate it. And uh, I also appreciate the comments on, uh, on step backs. I know it's sometimes not the most popular thing to talk about, but that's, Great, great to have that included. I'm gonna read off a few more comments here. Um, sounds like, you know, we have uh, some agreement around uh, the aesthetic in this building. Uh, you know, too many colors, materials, setbacks, setbacks, and you know, comments that they might be dated very quickly. Um, the articulation needs to be more uniform, uh, less at the upper levels and more at the ground level, and the color palette is not very exciting. So, a uh, greater setback width at ground floor retail for energy is also be, would be better here. Um, I have a raised hand from Monique. I'm gonna go to that. So Monique, you're, you're on. Yes, um, 
I just wanted to say that um, with the windows, as a former GC and doing a lot of estimating in my current role, mm -hmm. the windows are actually more expensive than the, the facade. And when you add in the aspects of thermal, um, the thermal transmission that happens through windows and as well as um, acoustics um, with San Mateo having a lot of rail um, in its, in its um, vicinity and stuff. Um, we have found that windows are more expensive than the facade and that it's better to um, still meet the, the daylighting standards that's needed, but not um, overly exceed them. So that being said, I would, I would discourage um, anything around making bigger, more windows because what it does is it, allow, it, it increases the solar, um, the solar needs on a project. And then we typically don't have enough roof space and areas to create, to be able to really offset the solar. So um, just being conscious of that, mm -hmm. just wanted to put that out there as a actual, you know, pricing exercise of windows are not cheaper than facade. They actually cost more expense to a project. Okay. I mean, yeah, thanks for, thanks for that uh, perspective, um, Monique. Uh, appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna actually read a few comments real quick here. It sounds like uh, cast, you know, from Keith Weber, cascading setbacks and articulation give the building an appealing texture, but in this example, it may have gone a bit too far. And then uh, we have Jordan agreeing with Adam, Adam's comments about the absurdity of a uh, setbacks and I think what we would talk about here is upper, maybe upper floor step backs but I think we're in the same same camp there. I don't I'm gonna call I'm gonna go unmute you right now one sec. Sure sure I just wanted to clarify what I had to say about the windows so it's not so much um, like necessarily bigger windows obviously people want more light especially in homes um, but the more, what, what I meant to say is, is trim. If you're going to put, um, you know, architectural detailing, um, not just facade, but architectural detailing, focus it around the windows. Um, you know, what the issue with this building is that the most prominent portions with color and massing are actually blank walls or portions of blank walls and the windows themselves recede. So you're wasting your precious dollars that you're spending on windows and kind of almost hiding them. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you actually make the windows feel bigger using trim, um, you know, other sorts of um, detailing that you see in, in some older buildings, you often can get, um, you know, a better aesthetic. Um, so yeah, I'm just, you know, windows, definitely everybody wants windows, you know, windows are uh, also, the biggest heat loss portion of, of a facade. So, you know, there's that balance. But I, I, my point was just about, since we're doing, we're talking about design, you know, focus the detail around windows and doors. Focus the prominence around windows and doors. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for the clarification, Adam. Do we have any other uh, comments on this on this example? Okay, um, Laura, when do you think we have time for uh, one more? Or it sounds like, you know, we're running up against the end of the meeting here. I wanted to maybe add some time for maybe if there's any more questions about the objective design standards themselves or... Um. Why don't we go ahead and um, summarize things, Blaze? And I, I think if it's okay with Wendy, uh, we could put this exercise up on the, the web page for the project and, and guide people to, to provide additional comments. Um, I, I, if you could just show the examples of the, the final two, Blaze, I, I think the, um, the comments that we're getting this evening are very insightful and, and certainly from people who are dealing with this every day. Um, 
So I, I think if those who participated tonight and, and others might take a look at these other projects that, that we've got and, and maybe send in some comments, this material will be up for, for folks to see. I, I think what we're getting at, um, we're, we're finding some similar themes um, what, as to what people are looking for. And, and so I think we've got some, some pretty good ideas to how to start to construct these. Yeah, I would agree. I think uh, we're seeing, um, we're receiving good comments. We're seeing some uh, similar themes. Um, and I'm happy to share the remaining uh, two examples on the city's webpage so that people can comment further if they like. Yeah, for, you know, for example, number seven is showing some great pedestrian activation and number eight is dealing with some of the common open space requirements that, that folks have talked about and how to, how to make it accessible. Uh, I we actually have I, a comment from, from a chat from SEMA saying we should also consider signage requirements for first floor retail. As far as I know, I think we don't, we're not going to address signage requirements in, in the objective design standards. Uh, as far as I know. That, that's correct. correct? The, the, yeah. yeah, we're not, we're not addressing this. The city's current sign regulations will stand. Oh. You know, this is the first time in all the years that I've been doing this work that somebody has brought up Wallace and Gromit in a public meeting. So I have to thank whoever did that for our claymation <laughs> reference. We actually have one comment from uh, a, a um, hand raise from Rocky. So Rocky, go ahead. Um, I didn't see examples of buildings in the four to six story range. Uh, I think I just saw the one um, that was mostly steel and glass. And um, I bring that up because uh, at the four to six story range, it's sort of the limit of type five construction, whether you have one mm -hmm. or two stories of concrete podium uh, base down at the bottom. So it would be good to have some of those examples because a lot of the, the multi-story buildings, I think primarily were at three stories, even this example here. And so uh, I think the step back building might have been four, but um, I think you're going to find that uh, a lot of developers are going to look at that four to six story range. Uh, I believe certain parts of San Mateo have a 45 story or a 45 foot height limit. And so you're going to have the four story with below grade parking, mm -hmm. but um, it's, it's going to be important to, to start looking at that because it's the threshold where an elevator comes in. There's other components that start to populate what the development has. And so it's, it's, it would be good to see that as a typology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th thanks Rocky. I think um, we, we can talk about this, but I think we might be able to offer, if we have a, when these examples get sent out, we can post them on the, on the city website and kind of leave a, kind of maybe an, a, a PDF that we can get some more comments on at, at a later date. But uh, that's a you know, great suggestion to include those examples in the uh, in, um, in a further materials review. Okay, so I'm actually going to go and um, we're gonna you know, final, finalize this meeting here. Um, basically, you know, an interactive discussion. Um, I just want to go over next steps of the project schedule. Obviously, as you know, we talked about earlier, this is it's very early in the process, and so a lot of a lot of this uh, conversation is really just kind of uh, get you all acquainted with the objective design standards. And uh, I think we had a great discussion about about a about elements of architectural design and how we can capture those through these standards. So um, as you can see here, you know, we, we are in the first phase of uh, the community workshop. We're going to you know be drafting objective design standards following a, uh, some focus group meetings and study session. And then um, moving on to the you know, further development of the, of the standards. So this is very early on. And um, like I said, there'll be more materials and uh, other touch points um, that you can see them, find on the website. So if you have any more questions or comments, um, you can visit the website. Um, and we need to, allow a public comment period. So is any final words? Any last points we could uh, do that now? We've had quite a few
folks on the line tonight, uh, Blaze and City staff, who have, I think, been listening very attentively. So we thank everybody who, who listened in and, and came this evening, particularly for all the, the great comments. And if you feel like uh, you didn't want to say anything tonight, that's, that's perfectly fine. All comments are welcome um, via the city's website or just even phone calls to Wendy. Wendy's the project manager on this. Phone calls and, and emails to Wendy. That's right. You can feel free to call me, um, email me. I believe everyone has my email address because I sent um, information about this meeting. Um, we'd love to hear more from everyone. With that, uh, Julia, Christina, did you have any final comments for the evening? Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Yeah, thanks, everyone, for your input and thoughtful comments. Um, I think we got a lot of good information, and we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thanks to the staff. I posted the, the website in the chat, so you, you, you all can just click on that and go straight to the uh, project website there. So we're all set. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.